Act Three, Scene One, Flanders, the French camp. Enter King Jean of France with two sons, Charles of Normandy and Philippe, along with the Duke of Lorraine. Here, tell our navy of a thousand sail to have made a breakfast of our foe by sea. Let us encamp to wait their happy speed. Lorraine, what readiness is Edward in? How hast thou heard that he provided is of martial furniture for this exploit? To lay aside unnecessary soothing, and not to spend the time in circumstance, tis brooded for certainty, my lord, that he's exceeding strongly fortified. His subjects flock as willingly to war as if unto a triumph they were led. England was wont to harbor malcontents, bloodthirsty and seditious Catalines, spendthrifts, and such as gape for nothing else, but changing and alteration of the state. And is it possible that they are now so loyal in themselves? All but the Scot, who solemnly protests, as heretofore I have informed your grace, never to sheathe his sword or take a truce. <laughs> That's the anchorage of some better hope. But on the other side, to think what friends King Edward hath retained in Netherlands among those ever bibbing epicures, those frothy Dutchmen puffed with double beer that drink and swill in every place they come, does not a little aggravate mine ire. Besides, we hear the emperor conjoins and stalls him in his own authority. But all the mightier that their number is, the greater glory reaps the victory. Some friends have we beside domestic power, the stern Polonian and the warlike Dane, the king of Bohemia and of Sicily, are all become confederates with us, and as I think are marching hither apace. But soft I hear the music of their drums, by which I guess that their approach is near. Ah, King John of France, as league and neighborhood requires, when friends are in any way distressed, I come to aid thee with my country's force. And from great Moscow, fearful to the Turk, and lofty Poland, nurse of hardy men, I bring these servitors to fight for thee, who willingly will venture in thy cause. Welcome, Bohemian king, and welcome all. This your kindness I will not forget. Besides your plentiful rewards and crowns that from our treasury ye shall receive, there comes a harebrained nation decked in pride, the spoil of whom will be a treble gain. And now my hope is full, my joy complete. At sea, we are as puissant as the force of Agamemnon in the haven of Troy. By land with Xerxes we compare strength, whose soldiers drank up rivers in their thirst. Then bayard like blind overweening Ned to reach at our imperial diadem is either to be swallowed of the waves or hack to pieces whence thou comest ashore. Near to the coast I have descried, my lord, as I was busy in my watchful charge, the proud armado of King Edward's ships, which at the first far off when I did ken, seemed as it were a grove of withered pines, but drawing near their glorious bright aspect, their streaming ensigns wrought of colored silk, like to a meadow full of sundry flowers, adorns the naked bosom of the earth. Majestical the order of their course, figuring the horned circle of the moon, and on the top gallant of the admiral, and likewise all the handmaids of his train, the arms of England and of France unite, are quartered equally by Harold's art. Thus tightly carried with a merry gale, they plow the ocean hitherward amain. Dare he already crop the fleur de lis? I hope the honey being gathered thence, he with the spider afterward approach, shall suck forth deadly venom from the leaves. But where's our navy? How are they prepared to wing themselves against this flight of ravens? They, having knowledge brought them by the scouts, 
did break from anchor straight and puffed with rage no otherwise than were their sails with wind made forth as when an empty eagle flies to satisfy his hungry griping maw else for thy news return unto thy bark and if thou escape the bloody stroke of war and do survive the conflict come again and let us hear the manner of the fight Mean space, my lords, tis best we be dispersed to several places, least a chance to land. First, you, my lord, with your Bohemian troops, shall pitch your battles on the lower land. My eldest son, the Duke of Normandy, together with the aid of Muscovite, shall climb the higher ground another way. Here, in the middle coast, betwixt you both, Philippe, my youngest boy, and I will lodge. So, lords, be gone and look unto your charge. You stand for France, an empire, an empire fair and large. Now tell me, Philippe, what is thy concept touching the challenge that the English make? I say, my lord, claim Edward what he can, and bring he ne'er so plain a pedigree. Tis you are in possession of the crown, and that's the surest point of all the law. But were it not, yet ere he should prevail, I'll make a conduit of my dearest blood or chase those staggling upstarts home again. Well said, young sheep. Call for bread and wine that we may cheer our stomachs with repast to look our foes most sternly in the face. Now is begun the heavy day at sea. Fight, Frenchmen, fight! Be like the field of bears when they defend their younglings in the caves. Stir, angry nemesis, the happy helm, that with the sulfur battles of your rage, the English fleet may be dispersed and sunk. Oh, Father, how this echoing canyon shot like sweet harmony digest my cates. Now, boy, thou hearst what thundering terror tis to buckle for a kingdom's sovereignty. The earth with giddy trembling when it shakes, or when the exhalations of the air break in extremity of lightning flash, affrights not more than kings when they dispose to show the rancor of their high swollen hearts. Retreat is sounded. One side hath the worse. Oh, if it be the French sweet fortune, turn, and in thy turning change the forward winds, that with advantage of a favoring sky, our men may vanquish and the other fly. My heart misgives. Say, mirror of pale death, to whom belongs the honor of this day? Relate, I pray thee, if thy breath will serve the sad discourse of this discomfiture. I will, my lord. My gracious sovereign, France hath taken the foil, and boasting Edward triumphs with success. These iron outed navies, when last I was reported to your grace, both full of angry spleen, of hope and fear, hasting to meet each other in the face, at last conjoined, and by their admiral, our admiral encountered many shot. By this, the other that beheld these twain give earnest penny of a further wreck, like fiery dragons took their haughty flight, and likewise meeting from their smoky wounds, sent many grim ambassadors of death. Then gan the sky to turn to gloomy night, and darkness did well enclose the quick as those who were but newly reft of life. No leisure served for friends to bid farewell, and if it had, the hideous noise was such as each to each other seemed deaf and dumb. Purple the sea, whose channel filled as fast with streaming gold that from the maimed fell, as did her gushing moisture break into the crannied cleftures of the through shot planks. Here flew a head, dissevered from the trunk. Their mangled arms and legs were tossed aloft as when a whirlwind takes the summer dust and scatters it in the middle of the air. Then might ye see the reeling vessels split 
and tottering sink into the ruthless flood until their lofty tops were seen no more. All shifts were tried, both for defense and hurt, and now the effect of valor and of force, of resolution and of cowardice were lively pictured. How the one for fame, the other by compulsion laid about. Much did the non that brave ship, so did the black snake of Bologna, then which a bonnier vessel never yet spread sail. But all in vain, both sun, the wind and tide, we brought it all unto our four men's side, that we perforce were fain to give them way, and they are landed. Thus my tale is done, we have untimely lost, and they have won. Then rests nothing but with present speed to join our several forces all in one and bid them battle ere they range too far. Come, gentle Philip, let us hence depart. This soldier's words have pierced thy father's heart. Act Three, Scene Two, Picardy. A road near Crecy. Enter two Frenchmen, meeting two citizens and a Frenchwoman with two little children. Well met, my masters. How now? What's the news? And wherefore are ye laden thus with stuff? What, is it quarter day that you should remove and carry bag and baggage too? Quarter day? Aye, and quartering day, I fear. Have ye not heard the news that flies abroad? What news? Oh, the French Navy is destroyed at sea, and that the English army is arrived. What then? What then, quoth you? Why is not time to fly, when envy and destruction is so nigh? Content thee, man. They're far enough from hence. And will be met, I warrant, to their cost before they break so far into the realm. Aye, so the grasshopper does spend the time in mirthful jollity till winter come. And then too late he would redeem his time, and frozen cold hath nipped his careless head. He that no sooner will provide a cloak, and when he sees it doth begin to rain. Hey, for adventure for his negligence, he thoroughly washed when he suspects it not. We that have charge in such a train as this, must look in time to look for them and us, lest when we would, we cannot be relieved. Be belike you then despair of all success and think your country will be subjugate? We cannot tell. Tis good to fear the worst. Yet rather fight than, like unnatural sons, forsake your loving parents in distress. Tush, they that have already taken arms are many fearful millions in respect of that small handful of our enemies. Uh, but tis a rightful quarrel must prevail. Edward is son unto our late king's sister, where John Villa was three degrees removed. Besides, there is a prophecy abroad, published by one that was a friar once, whose oracles have many times proved true. And now, he says, this time will shortly come when, as a lion roused in the West, shall carry and the flor de lis of France. These, I can tell ye, and such like surmises, strike many Frenchmen cold unto the heart. Fly, countrymen and citizens of France. Sweet flowering peace, the root of happy life, is quite abandoned and expulsed the land, instead of whom runs a constraining war, sits like to raven upon your house's tops, Slaughter and mischief walk within your streets, and unrestrained make havoc as they pass. The form whereof e'en now I myself beheld upon this fair mountain whence I came, for of so far of as I directed my eyes, I might perceive five cities all on fire, cornfields and vineyards burning like an oven, and as the leaking vapor in the wind turned but aside, I likewise might discern the poor inhabitants escape the flame fall numberless upon the soldiers' pikes. Three ways 
these dreadful ministers of wrath do tread the measures of their tragic march upon the right hand comes the conquering king upon the left his hot unbridled son and in the midst of our nation's glittering host all which though distant yet conspire in one to leave desolation where they come fly therefore citizens if you be wise seek out some habitation further off here if you stay your wives will be abused your treasure shared before your weeping eyes shelter you yourselves for now the storm doth rise away away methinks i hear their drums a wretched france i greatly feel thy fall thy glory shaketh like a tottering wall Act three, scene three, Picardy, the fields near Cressy. Enter King Edward, the Earl of Derby, with Gobain de Grasse. Where is the Frenchman by whose cunning guide we found the shallow of this river Somme, and had directions how to pass the sea? Here, my good lord. How art thou called? Tell me thy name. Uh, Gobain de Grasse, if please, your excellence. Then, Gobain, for the service thou hast done, we here enlarge and give thee liberty. And, for recompense beside this good, thou shalt receive five hundred marks in gold. I know not how we should have met our son, who now in heart I wish I might behold. Good news, my lord. The prince is out at hand, and with him comes Lord Audley and the rest, whom since our landing we could never meet. <laughs> Welcome, fair prince. How hast thou sped, my son, since thy arrival on the coast of France? Successfully, I thank the gracious heavens. Some of their strongest cities we have won, as Barfleur, Lowe, Artois, and Carentan, and others wasted, leaving at our heels a wide apparent field and beaten path for solitariness to progress in. Yet those that would submit, we kindly pardon, but who in scorn refused our proffered peace, endured the penalty of sharp revenge. <laughs> Ah, uh, France, why shouldst thou be thus obstinate against the kind embracement of thy friends? How gently had we thought to touch thy breast and set our foot upon thy tender mould. But that, in froward and disdainful pride, thou, like a skittish and untamed colt, dost start aside and strike us with thy heels. But tell me, Ned, in all thy warlike course, hast thou not seen the usurping king of France? Yes, my good lord, and not two hours ago, with full a hundred thousand fighting men. Upon the one side of the river's bank, and on the other both, his multitudes. I fear he would have cropped our smaller power. Happily, perceiving your approach, he hath withdrawn himself to Cressy Plains, where, as it seemeth by his good array, he means to bid us battle present. We shall be welcome. That's the thing we crave. Edward, know that Jean the true king of France, musing thou shouldst encroach upon his land and in thy tyrannous proceeding slay his faithful subjects and subvert his towns, spits in thy face, and in this manner following upbraids thee with thine arrogant intrusion. First condemn thee for a fugitive, a thievish pirate and a needy mate, one that hath either no abiding place, or else inhabiting some barren soil, where neither herb nor fruitful grain is had, dost altogether live by pilfering. Next, insomuch thou hast infringed thy faith, broke leave and solemn covenant made with me, I hold thee for a false, pernicious wretch. And last of all, although I scorn to cope with one so much inferior to myself, yet in the respect thy thirst is all for gold, thy labor rather to be feared than loved, to satisfy thy lust in either part, here am I come, and with me I have brought exceeding store of treasure, pearl and coin. Leave therefore now to persecute the weak, and armed entering conflict with the armed, let it be seen amongst other petty thefts how thou canst win this pillage manfully. If gall or wormwood have a pleasant taste, then is thy salutation honey sweet. But 
as the one hath no such property, so is the other most satirical. Yet what how I regard thy worthless taunts. If thou have uttered them to foil my fame, or dim the reputation of my birth, know that thy wolvish barking cannot hurt. If slyly to insinuate with the world, and with a strumpet's artificial line, to paint thy vicious and deformed cause, be well assured, the counterfeit will fade, and in the end thy foul defects be seen. But if thou didst it to provoke me on, as who should say I were but timorous, or coldly negligent did need a spur, bethink thyself how slack I was at sea, how since my landing I have won no towns, entered no further but upon the coast, and there have ever since securely slept. But if I have been otherwise employed, imagine, voila, whether I intend to skirmish, not for pillage, but for the crown which thou dost wear, and that I vow to have, or one of us shall fall into his grave. Look not for cross invectives at our hands, or railing execrations of the spite. The creeping serpents hid in hollow banks sting with their tongues. We have remorseless swords, and they shall plead for us and our affairs. Yet thus much briefly, by my father's leave, as all the immodest poison of thy throat is scandalous and most notorious lies, and our pretended quarrel is truly just, so end the battle when we meet today. May either of us prosper and prevail, or luckless, cursed, receive eternal shame. That needs no further question, and I know his conscience witnesseth. It is my right. Therefore, voila, say, wilt thou yet resign before the sickles thrust into the corn or that enkindled fury turn to flame? Edward, I know what right thou hast in France. And ere I basely will resign my crown, this champion field shall be a pool of blood and all our prospect as a slaughterhouse. Aye, that it proves thee, tyrant, what thou art. No father, king, or shepherd of thy realm, but one that tears her entrails with thy hands, and like a thirsty tiger sucks her blood. You peers of France, why do you follow him that is so prodigal to spend your lives? Whom should they follow, aged impotent, but he that is their true-born sovereign? Upbraids thou him, because within his face time hath engraved deep characters of age. No, these grave scholars of experience, like stiff-grown oaks, will stand immovable when whirlwind quickly turns up younger trees. Is ever any of thy father's house king but thyself before this present time? It was great lineage by thy mother's side. Five hundred years hath held the scepter up. Judge then conspirators by this descent. He's the true-born sovereign, this or that. Father, rage your battles, prate no more. These English fain would spend ti the time in words that, night approaching, they might escape unfought. Lords and my loving subjects, now's the time that your intended force must bide the touch. Therefore, my friends, consider this in brief. That he you fight for is your natural key. He against whom you fight, a foreigner. He that you fight for rules in clemency and reigns you with a mild and gentle bit. He against whom you fight, if he prevail, will straight enthrone himself in tyranny, make slaves of you, and with a heavy hand curtail and curb your sweetest liberty. Then, to protect your country and your king, let but the hearty courage of your hearts answer the number of your able hands, and we shall quickly chase these fugitives. For what's this Edward but a belly god, a tender and lascivious wantonness that the other day was almost dead for love? And what, I pray you, is his goodly guard, such as? but scant them of their chines of beef, and take away their downy feather beds, 
and presently they are as rusty stiff as twere a many overridden jades. Then Frenchmen, scorn that such should be your lords, and rather bind ye them in captive bands. Vive le roi! God save King John of France. Now, on this plain of Crecy, spread yourselves, and Edward, when thou darest, begin the fight. We presently will meet thee, John of France. And, English lords, let us resolve this day either to clear us of that scandalous crime or be entombed in our innocence. And Ned, because this battle is the first that ever yet thou foughtst in a pitched field, as ancient custom is of martialists, to dub thee with the tip of chivalry in solemn manner, we will give thee arms. Come, therefore, heralds, orderly, bring forth a strong attirement for the prince, my son. Edward Plantagenet, in the name of God, as with this armor I impall thy breast, so be thy noble, unrelenting heart walled in with flint of matchless fortitude, that never base affections enter there. Fight, and be valiant, conquer where thou comest. Now follow, lords, and do him honor too. Edward Plantagenet, Prince of Wales, as I do set this helmet on thy head, wherewith the chamber of thy brain is fenced, so may thy temples, with Elena's hand, still adorned with laurel victory, fight and be valiant, conquer where thou comest. Edward Plantagenet, Prince of Wales, receive this lance into thy mighty manly hand, use it in fashion of a brazen pen to draw forth bloody stratagems in France, and print thy valiant deeds in honor's book. Fight, be valiant, conquer where thou comest. Edward Plantagenet, Prince of Wales, hold, take this target, wear it on thy arm, and may the view thereof, like Perseus' shield, astonish and transform thy gazing foes to senseless images of meager death. Fight and be valiant. Conquer where thou comest. Now wants there naught but knighthood, which deferred we leave, till thou hast won it in the field. My gracious father and ye forward peers, this honor you have done me animates and cheers my green yet scarce appearing strength with comfortable good presaging signs, no otherwise than did old Jacob's words when as he breathed his blessings on his sons. These hallowed gifts of yours when I profane or use them not to glory of my God, to patronage the fatherless and poor, or for the benefit of England's peace, benumb my joints, wax feeble both mine arms, wither my heart that, like a sapless tree, I may remain the map of infamy. Then thus our steeled battle shall be ranged. The leading of the vayward net is thine. To dignify whose lusty spirit is the more, we temper it with Audley's gravity, that courage and experience joined in one. Your manage may be second unto none. For the main battles I will guide myself, Darby, in the rearward march behind that orderly disposed and set in ray, let us to horse, and God grant us the day. Act 3, Scene 4, The Battlefield Outside Cressy Enter French soldiers fleeing, enter King John and the Duke of Lorraine. Oh, Lorraine! Say what mean our men to fly? Our number is far greater than our force. Uh, the garrison of Genoese, my lord, that came from Paris, wary with their march, grudging to be so suddenly employed, no sooner in the forefront took their place, but straight retiring, so dismayed the rest, as likewise they betook themselves to flight, in which, for haste to make a safe escape, more in the clustering throng are pressed to death than by the enemy a thousandfold. Oh, hapless fortune, let us yet say if we can counsel some of them to stay. Act 3, Scene 5, Another Part of the Battlefield. Enter King Edward and Audley. 
Lord Audley, whilst our son is in the chase, withdraw our powers unto this little hill, and here a season let us breathe ourselves. I will, my lord. Just doing heaven, whose secret providence to our gross judgment is inscrutable. How are we bound to praise thy wondrous works that has this day given way unto the right and made the wicked stumble at themselves? Rescue at King Edward. Rescue for thy son. Rescue, Artois? What, is he prisoner or by violence fell beside his horse? Neither, my lord, but narrowly beset with turning Frenchmen whom he did pursue. And tis impossible that he should escape, except your highness presently descend. Tut! Let him fight. We gave him arms today, and he is laboring for a knighthood, man. Prince! My lord, the prince! Who oh, succor him! He's close encompassed with a world of odds. Then will he win a world of honor, too, if he by valor can redeem him thence. If not, what, what remedy? We have more sons than one to comfort our declining age. Renouted Edward, give me leave, I pray, to lead my soldiers where I, where I may relieve your grace's son in danger to be slain. The snares of French, like emmets on a bank, muster about him, whilst he, lion-like, entangled in the net of their assaults, frantically rends and bites the woven toil, but all in vain. He cannot free himself. Oddly content! I will not have a man, on pain of death, sent forth to succor him. This is the day ordained by destiny to season his courage with those grievous thoughts that, if he breaketh out, Nestor's years on earth will make him savor still of this exploit. Ah, uh, he shall not live to see those days. Why, then his epitaph is lasting praise. Yet, good my lord, tis too much willfulness to let his blood be spilt that may be saved. Exclaim no more! For none of you can tell whether a borrowed aid will serve or no. Perhaps he is already slain. Or ten. And dare a falcon when she's in her flight, and ever after she'll be haggard-like. Let Edward be delivered by our hands, and still, in danger, he'll expect the like. But, if himself, himself redeem from thence, he will have vanquished cheerful death and fear, and ever after dread their force no more than if they were but babes or captive slaves. Cruel father. Farewell, Edward, then. Farewell, sweet prince. The hope of chivalry. Or would my life might ransom him from death. <laughs> But soft, methinks I hear the dismal charge of trumpets' loud retreat. All are not slain, I hope, that went with him. Some will return with tidings, good or bad. Oh, joyful sight, victorious Edward lives! Welcome, brave prince! Welcome, Plantagenet! First, having done my duty as beseemed, lords, I would greet you all with hearty thanks. And now, behold, after my winter's toil, my painful voyage on the boisterous sea of wars, devouring gulfs and steely rocks, I bring my fraught unto the wished port, my summer's hope, my travel's sweet reward. And here, with humble duty, I present this sacrifice, this first fruit of my sword, cropped and cut down e'en at the gate of death, the king of Bohemia, father, whom I slew whose thousands had entrenched me round about and lay as thick upon my battered crest as on an anvil with their ponderous glaives. Yet marble courage still did undercrop, and when my weary arms, with often blows, like the continual laboring woodman's axe that is enjoined to fell a load of oaks, began to falter, straight I would recover my gifts you gave me and my zealous vow, and then new courage made me fresh again, that in despite I carved my passage forth and put the multitude to speedy flight. Lo, thus hath Edward's hand filled your request, and done, I hope, the duty of a knight. Aye. Well, thou hast deserved a knighthood, Ned. 
And therefore, with thy sword, yet reeking warm with blood of those that fought to be thy bane, arise, Prince Edward, trusty knight at arms. This day thou hast confounded me with joy, and prove thyself fit heir unto a king. Here is a note, my gracious lord, of those that in this conflict of our foes were slain. Eleven princes of esteem, fourscore barons, a hundred and twenty knights, and thirty thousand common soldiers. Of our men, thousand. Our God be praised! Now, John of France, I hope thou knowest King Edward for no wantonness, no lovesick cockney, nor his soldiers' jades. But which way has the fearful king escaped? Towards Partier, noble father, and his sons. Ned, thou and Audley shall pursue them still. Myself and Darby will to Calais straight, and there begirt that haven town with siege. Now lies it on an upshot, therefore strike! And whistly follow whiles the game's on foot. What picture's this? A pelican, my lord, wounding her bosom with her crooked beak, that so her nest of young ones may be fed with drops of blood that issue from her heart. The motto, sic et vos, and so should you. <laughs> Act 4, Scene 1, Brittany, the English camp. Enter Lord Montford and the Earl of Salisbury. My Lord of Salisbury, since by your aid mine enemy, Sir Charles of Blois, is slain, and I again am quietly possessed in Britannia's dukedom, know that I resolve, for this kind furtherance of your king and you, to swear allegiance to his majesty, in sign whereof receive this coronet, Bear it unto him, and with all mine oath, never to be but Edward's faithful friend. I take it, Monford. Thus I hope ere long the whole dominions of the realm of France will be surrendered to his conquering hand. Now if I knew but safely how to pass, I would at Calais gladly meet his grace, whither I am by letters certified that he intends to have his host removed. It shall be so. This policy will serve. Uh, ho, who's within? Bring Villiers to me. Villiers, thou know'st thou art my prisoner, and that I might, for ransom, if I would, require of thee a hundred thousand francs, or else retain and keep thee captive still. Uh, but, but so it is, that for a smaller charge thou mayst be quit, and if thou wilt thyself, and this is it, procure me but a passport of Charles, the Duke of Normandy, that I, without restraint, may have recourse to Calais, through all the countries where he hath to do, which thou mayest easily obtain, I think, by reason, I have often heard thee say, he and thou were students once together, and then thou shalt be set at liberty. How sayest thou? Wilt thou undertake to do it? I will, my lord, but I must speak with him. Why, so thou shalt. Uh, take horse and post from hence. Only before thou goest, swear by thy faith that if thou canst not compass my desire, thou wilt return my prisoner back again and that shall be sufficient warrant for me. To that condition I agree, my lord, and will unfeignedly perform the same. Farewell, Villiers. Thus once I mean to try a Frenchman's faith. Act Four, Scene Two. Picardy, the English camp before Calais. Enter King Edward and Darby. Since they refuse our proffered league, my lord, and will not ope their gates and let us in, we will entrench ourselves on every side, that neither victuals nor supply of men may come to succor this accursed town. Famine shall combat where our swords are stopped. Promise aid that made them stand aloof is now retired and gone another way. We will repent them of their stubborn will. But what are these poor ragged slaves, my lord? Ask what they are. It seems they come from Calais. You wretched patterns of despair and woe. What are you, living men or gliding ghosts, crept from your graves to walk upon the earth? No ghosts, my lord, but men that breathe a life far worse than is the quiet sleep of death. 
We are distressed, poor inhabitants that long have been diseased, sick, and lame. And now, because we are not fit to serve, the captain of the town hath thrust us forth that so expensive victuals may be saved. A cheerful deed, no doubt, and worthy praise. But how do you imagine then to speed? We are your enemies. In such a case, we can no less but put ye to the sword, since when we proffered truce, it was refused. And if your grace no otherwise vouchsafe, as welcome death is unto us as life. Oh, poor silly men, much wronged and more distressed. Go, Darby, go, and see they be relieved. Command that victuals be appointed them, and give to every one five crowns apiece. The lion scorns to touch the yielding prey, and Edward's sword must flesh itself in such as willful stubbornness hath made perverse. Lord Percy, welcome. What's the news in England? The queen, my lord, comes here to your grace, and from her highness and the lord vicegerent, I bring this happy tidings of success. David, of Scotland, lately up in arms, thinking belike he soon should prevail. Your Highness, being absent from the realm, is, by the fruitful service of your peers and painful travel of the Queen herself, that, big with child, was every day in arms, vanquished, subdued, and taken prisoner. Thanks, Percy, for thy news with all my heart. What was he took him prisoner in the field? A squire, my lord. John Copeland was his name, who since, entreated by her majesty, denies to make surrender of his prize to any but unto your grace alone, whereat the queen is grievously displeased. <laughs> well, then we'll have a pursuivant dispatched to summon Copeland hither out of hand, and with him he shall bring his prisoner king. The queen's, my lord, herself by this at sea, and purposeth, as soon as the wind will serve, to land at Calais and to visit. She shall be welcome, and to wait her coming, I'll pitch my tent near to the sandy shore. The burgesses of Calais, mighty king, have by a council willingly decreed to yield the town and castle to your hands, upon condition it would please your grace to grant them benefit of life and goods. They will so? Then, belike they may command, dispose, elect, and govern as they list. No, sirrah. Tell them, since they did refuse our princely clemency at first proclaimed, they shall not have it now, although they would. I will accept of naught but fire and sword, except within these two days six of them that are the wealthiest merchants in the town, come naked, all but for their linen shirts, with each a halter hanged about his neck, and prostrate yield themselves upon their knees to be afflicted, hanged, or what I please. And so you may inform their masterships. Why, this it is to trust a broken staff. Had we not been persuaded, John, our king, would with his army have relieved the town. We had not stood upon defiance so, but now tis past, that no man can recall, and better some do go to wreck them all. Act 4, Scene 3. Poitou, the French camp near Poitiers. Enter Charles, Duke of Normandy, and Villiers. I wonder, Villiers, thou shouldst importune me for one that is our deadly enemy. Not for his sake, my gracious lord, so much am I become an earnest advocate, as that thereby my ransom will be quit. Uh, thy ransom, man? Why needst thou talk of that? Art thou not free? And are not all occasions that happen for advantage of our foes to be accepted of and stood upon? No, good my lord, except the same be just. 
for profit must with honor be commixed, or else our actions are but scandalous. But letting pass their intricate objections, will please your highness to subscribe or not? Yea, I will not, nor I cannot do it. Salisbury shall not have his will so much to claim a passport, however it pleaseth himself. Why, then I know the extremity, my lord. I must return to prison whence I came. Return? I hope thou wilt not. What bird that hath escaped the fowler's gin will not beware how she's ensnared again? Or what is he so senseless and secure that, having hardly passed a dangerous gulf, will put himself in peril there again? Ah, but it is mine oath, my gracious lord, which I in conscience may not violate, or else a kingdom should not draw me hence. Thine oath? Why, that doth bind thee to abide. Hast thou not sworn obedience to thy prince? In all things that uprightly he commands, but either to persuade or threaten me, not to perform the covenant of my word, is lawless, and I need not to obey. Why, is it lawful for a man to kill and not to break a promise with his foe? To kill, my lord, when war is once proclaimed, so that our quarrel may be for wrongs received, no doubt, is lawfully permitted us. But in an oath we must be well advised how we do swear, and when we once have sworn, not to infringe it, though we die therefore. Therefore, my lord, as willing I return, as if I were to fly a paradise. Stay, my Villiers. Thine honorable mind deserves to be eternally admired. Thy suit shall be no longer thus deferred. Give me the paper. I'll subscribe to it. And wherefore, too, I love thee as Villiers. Hereafter I'll embrace thee as myself. Stay, and be still in favor with thy lord. I humbly thank your grace. I must dispatch and send this passport first into the Earl, and then I will attend your highness' pleasure. Do so, Villiers. And Charles, when he hath need, be such as soldiers, however he speak. Come, Charles, and arm thee. Edward is entrapped. The Prince of Wales is fallen into our hands, and we have compassed him. He cannot escape. But will your highness fight today? What else, my son? He's scarce 8,000 strong, and we are three score thousand at the least. I have a prophecy, my gracious lord, wherein is written what success is like to happen us in this outrageous war. It was delivered me at Cressy Field by one that is an aged hermit there. When feathered fowl shall make thine army tremble, and flint stones rise and break the battle ray. Then think on him that doth not now dissemble, for that shall be the hapless dreadful day. Yet in the end thy foot thou shalt advance as far in England as thy foe in France. By this it seems we shall be fortunate, for as it is impossible that stones should ever rise and break the battle ray, or, or airy fowl make men in arms to quake, so it is like we shall not be subdued. Or, or say this might be true, yet in the end, since he doth promise we shall drive him hence and forage their country as they have done ours, by this revenge that loss will seem the less. But all our frivolous fancies, toys, and dreams, once we are sure we have ensnared the son, catch we the father after how we can. Act four, scene four, an English redoubt near Poitiers. Enter Prince Edward, Audley, and others. Oddly, the arms of death embrace us round, and comfort have we none, save that to die we pay sour earnest for a sweeter life. At Cressy Field our clouds of warlike smoke choked up those French mouths and dissevered them. But now there are multitudes of millions hide, masking as twere the beauteous burning sun, leaving no hope to us but sullen dark and eyeless terror of all ending night. This sudden, mighty, and expedient head that they have made, fair prince, is wonderful. 
Uh, before us, in the valley, lies the king, vantaged with all that heaven and earth can yield. His party, stronger battle than our whole. Uh, his son, the braving Duke of Normandy, has trimmed the mountain on our right hand up in shining plate, that now the aspiring hill shows like a silver quarry or an orb, aloft the which the banners, bannerets, and new replenished pendants cuff the air and beat the winds that for their gaudiness struggles to kiss them. <laughs> and on our left hand lies the, le the younger issue of the king, coating the other hill in such array that all his gilded upright pikes do seem straight trees of gold. <laughs> The pendants, leaves, and their device of antique heraldry, quartered in colors seeming sundry fruits, makes it the orchard of the Hesperides. Behind us, too, the hill doth bear his height, for like a half-moon opening but one way it rounds us in, and there at our backs are lodged the fatal crossbows. The battle there is governed by the rough Chatillon. <laughs> Thus it stands. The valley, for our flight the king binds us in, the hills on either hand are proudly royalized by his sons, and on the hill behind stands certain death in pay and service with Chatillon. Death's name is much more mighty than his deeds. Thy parceling this power hath made it more. As many sands as these my hands can hold, are but my handful of so many sands. Then all the world, and call it but a power, easily tain up quickly thrown away. But if I stand to count them sand by sand, the number would confound my memory and make a thousand millions of a task, which briefly is no more indeed than one. These quarters, squadrons, and these regiments before, behind us, and on either hand are but a power. When we name a man, his hand, his foot, his head hath several strengths, and being all but one self instant strength, why all this many oddly is but one. And we can call it all but one man's strength. He that hath far to go tells it by miles. If he should tell the steps, it kills his heart. The drops are infinite that make a flood, and yet thou knowest we call it but a rain. There is but one France, one king of France. That France hath no more kings, and that same king hath but the puissant legion of one king, and we have one. Then apprehend no odds, for one to one is fair equality. What tidings, messenger, be plain and brief. The king of France, my sovereign lord and master, greets by me his foe, the prince of Wales. If thou call forth a hundred men of name, of lords, knights, squires, and English gentlemen, and with thyself and those, kneel at his feet, he straight will fold his bloody colors up, and ransom shall redeem lives forfeited. If not, this day shall drink more English blood than e'er was buried in our British earth. What is the answer to his preferred mercy? This heaven, that covers France, contains the mercy that draws from me submissive orisons. That such base breath should vanish from my lips to urge the plea of mercy to a man, the Lord forbid! Return and tell the king my tongue is made of steel and it shall beg my mercy on his coward burgonet. Tell him my colors are as red as his, my men as bold, our English arms as strong. Return him my defiance in his face. I go. What news with thee? The Duke of Normandy, my lord and master, pitying thy youth, is so engirt with peril. By me hath sent a nimble-jointed jennet, as swift as ever yet thou didst bestride. And wherewithal he counsels thee to fly, else death himself hath sworn that thou shalt die. Back with the beast unto the beast that sent him. Tell him I cannot sit a coward's horse. Bid him today bestride the jade himself, for I will stain my horse quite o'er with blood and double gild my spurs, but I will catch him. So tell the carping boy and get thee gone. Edward of Wales, Philip, 
the second son of the most mighty Christian king of France. Seeing thy body's living date expired, all full of charity and Christian love, commends this book, full fraught with prayers, to thy fair hand. For thy hour of life, entreat thee that thou meditate therein, and arm thy soul for her long journey towards. Thus I have done this bidding and return. Herald of Philip, greet thy lord from me. All good that he can send, I can receive. But thinkst thou not the unadvised boy hath wronged himself in thus far tendering me? Happily he cannot pray without the book. I think him no divine extempore. Then render back this common place of prayer to do himself good in adversity. Beside, he knows not my sin's quality and therefore knows no prayers for my avail. Ere night, his prayer may be to pray to God, to put it in my heart to hear his prayer. So tell the courtly wanton and be gone. I go. How confident their strength and number makes them. Now, oddly, sound those silver wings of thine and let those milk white messengers of time show thy time's learning in this dangerous time. Thyself art bruised and bit with many broils and stratagems forepassed with iron pens are texted in thine honorable face. Thou art a married man in this distress, but danger woos me as a blushing maid. Teach me an answer to this perilous time. To die is all as common as to live. The one in choice, the other holds in chase. For from the instant we begin to live, we do pursue and hunt the time to die. First bud we, then we blow, and after seed, then presently we fall. And as a shade follows the body, so we follow death. If then we hunt for death, why do we fear it? If we fear it, why do we follow it? If we do fear, how can we shun it? If we do fear with fear, we do but aid the thing we fear to seize on us the sooner. But if we fear not, then no resolved proffer can overthrow the limit of our fate. Or whether ripe or rotten trop we shall. And we do draw the lottery of our doom. Oh, good old man. A thousand, thousand armors these words of thine have buckled on my back. What an idiot hast thou made of life to seek the thing it fears, and how disgraced the imperial victory of murdering death, since all the lives his conquering arrows strike seek him, and he not them, to shame his glory. I will not give a penny for a life, nor half a half penny to shun grim death, since for to live is but to seek to die, and dying but beginning of new life. But come the hour when he that rules it will, to live or die I hold indifferent. Act Four, Scene Five, The French Cap at Poitiers. Enter King John and Charles. A sudden darkness has defaced the sky. The winds have crept into their caves for fear. The leaves move not. The world is hushed and still. The birds cease singing, and the wandering brooks murmur no wanted greeting to their shores. Silence attends some wonder, and expecteth that heaven should pronounce some prophecy. Where? Or oh, from whom proceeds the silence, sir? Our men, with open mouths and staring eyes, look on each other as they did attend each other's words, and yet no creature speaks. A tongue-tied fear hath made a midnight hour, and speeches sleep through all the waking regions. But now the pompous sun, in all his pride, looked through the golden coach upon the world, and on a sudden, hath he hid himself, that now the under-earth is as a grave, dark, deadly, silent, and uncomfortable. Ah, 
Hark, what a deadly outcry do I hear. Here comes my brother Philip. All dismayed. What fearful words are those thy looks presage? A flight, a flight! Coward, what flight? Thou liest, there needs no flight. A flight! Awake thy craven powers and tell on the substance of that very fear indeed, which is so ghastly printed in thy face. What is the matter? A flight of ugly ravens do croak and hover over our soldiers' heads and keep in triangles, cornered squares, right as our forces are embattled. With their approach there came this sudden fog, which now hath hid the airy floor of heaven and made a noon and night unnatural upon the quaking and dismayed world. In brief, our soldiers had let fall their arms and stay like metamorphous images, bloodless and pale, one glazing on another. I now I call to mind the prophecy, but I must give no entrance to a fear. Return and hearten up these yielding souls. Tell them the ravens seen them in arms, so many fair against a famished few, come but to dine upon their handiwork and prey upon the carrion that they kill. For when we see a horse laid down to die, although he be not dead, the ravenous birds sit watching the departure of his life. Even so, these ravens, for the carcasses of those poor English that are marked to die, hover about. And if they cry to us, it is but for a meat that we must kill for them. Away and comfort up my soldiers and sound the trumpets and at once dispatch this little business of a silly fraud. Behold, my liege, this knight and forty more, of whom the better part are slain and fled. They all endeavor sought to break our ranks and make their way to the encompassed prince. Dispose of him as please your majesty. Go and the next bow soldier that thou seest, disgrace it with his body presently. For I do hold a tree in France too good to be the gallows of an English thief. My lord of Normandy, I have your pass and warrant for my safety through this land. Villiers procured it for thee, did he not? He did. And it is current, thou shalt freely pass. I freely to the gallows to be hanged, without denial or impediment. Away with him! I hope your highness will not so disgrace me and dash the virtue of my seal at arms. He hath my never broken name to show, charactered with this princely hand of mine, and rather let me leave to be a prince than break the stable verdict of a prince. I do beseech you, let him pass in quiet. Thou and thy word lie both in my command. What canst thou promise that I cannot break? Which of these twain is greater infamy, to disobey thy father or thyself? Thy word, no no man's may exceed his power. No, that same man doth never break his word, that keeps it to the utmost of his, of his power. The breach of faith dwells in the soul's consent, which if thyself without consent do break, thou art not charged with the breach of faith. Go, hang him, for thy license lies in me, and my constraint stands the excuse for thee. What? Am I not a soldier in my word? Then arms adieu and let them fight that list. Shall I not give my girdle from my waist, but with a guardian I shall be controlled to say I may not give my things away? Upon my soul, have Edward, Prince of Wales, engaged his word, writ down his noble hand for all your knights to pass his father's land. The royal king, to grace his warlike son, would not alone safe contact give to them, but with all bounty feasted them and theirs. Dwellst thou on precedence? Then be it so. 
Say, Englishman, what degree thou art. Uh, in Earl in England, though a prisoner here, and those that know me call me Salisbury. Then, Salisbury, say whither thou art bound. Uh, to Calais, where my liege King Edward is. To Calais, Salisbury? Then to Calais, pack? And bid the king prepare a noble grave to put his princely son, Black Edward, in. And as thou travelest westward from this place, some two leagues hence there is a lofty hill, whose top seems topless for the embracing sky, doth hide his head high in her Asia bosom, upon whose tall top, when thy foot attains, look back upon the humble vale beneath. Humble of late, but now made proud with arms. And thence behold the wretched Prince of Wales, hooped with a band of iron round about, after which sight to Calais spur remain and say the Prince was smothered and not slain. And tell the king this is not all his ill, for I will greet him ere he thinks I will. Away, be gone. The smoke but of our shot will choke our foes, though bullets hit them not. Act 4, Scene 6, The Battlefield at Poitiers. Yeah! Enter Prince Edward and Artois. How fares your grace? Are you not shot, my lord? <coughs> no, dear Artois, but choked with dust and smoke, and stepped aside for breath and fresher air. Breathe, then, and do it again. The amazed French are quite distracted with gazing on the crows, and were our quivers full of shafts again, your grace should see a glorious day of this. Oh, for more arrows, lord, that's our want. A courage, Artois, a fig! For feathered shafts, when feathered fowls do bandy on our side. What need we fight and sweat and keep a coil when railing crows outscold our adversaries? Up, up, Artois! The ground itself is armed with fire containing flint. Command our bows to hurl away their pretty colored you and do it with stones. Away, Artois, away! My soul doth prophesy we win the day. Act 4, Scene 7. Another part of the battlefield. Enter King John. Our multitudes are in themselves confounded, dismayed and distraught. Swift starting fear hath buzzed a cold dismay through all our army, and every petty disadvantage prompts the fear possessed abject soul to fly. Myself, whose spirit is steel to their dull lead, but with recalling of the prophecy, and that our native stones from English arms rebel against us, find myself attainted with strong surprise of weak and yielding fear. Fly, father, fly. The French do kill the French. Some that would stand let drive at some that fly. Our drums strike nothing but discouragement. Our trumpets sound dishonor and retire. The spirit of fear, the fear that feareth not but death, cowardly works confusion on itself. Look out your eyes and see not this day's shame. An arm hath beat an army. One poor David hath with a stone foiled twenty stout Goliaths. Some twenty naked starvelings with small flints hath driven back a puissant host of men, arrayed and fenced in all accomplishments. Mon Dieu, they quite at us and kill us up. No less than forty thousand wicked elders have forty lean slaves this day stoned to death. Oh, that I were some other countryman. This day hath set desertion on the French, and all the world will blurt and scorn at us. What, is, is there no hope left? No hope, but death to bury up our shame. Make up once more with me, 
the 20th part of those that live are men and not a quail, the feeble handful on the adverse part. Then charge again. If heaven be not opposed, we cannot lose the day. On, away! Act 4, Scene 8, Another Part of the Battlefield. Enter oddly, wounded, being rescued by two esquires. Oh, fares, my lord. Uh, even as a man may do that dines at a, such a bloody feast as this. I hope, I hope, my lord, that is no mortal scar. Uh, no, no matter if it be. Count is cast, and in the worst... Ends but a mortal man. Good friends, convey me to the princely Edward, that in the crimson bravery of my blood I may become him with saluting him. I'll smile and tell him that this open scar doth end the harvest of his Otley's war. Act 4, Scene 9. The English camp at Poitiers. Enter Prince Edward with King John and Charles as prisoners. Now, John in France, and lately John of France, thy bloody ensigns are my captive colors. And you, high vaunting Charles of Normandy, at once today sent me a horse to fly, are now the subjects of my clemency. Fly, lords, is it not a shame that English boys whose early days are yet not worth a beard, should in the bosom of your kingdom thus, one against twenty, beat you up together? Thy fortune, not thy fault, has conquered us. An argument that heaven aids the right. See, see, Artois doth bring with him along the late good counsel giver to my soul. Welcome, Artois, and welcome, Philip, too. Who now of you or I have need to pray? Now is the proverb verified in you, too bright a morning breeds a lowering day. Hey, grim discouragement comes here. Alas, what thousand armored men of France have writ that note of death in Audley's face? Speak, thou warmest death with thy careless smile, and look so merrily upon thy grave, as if thou were enamored on thine end. What hungry sword has so bereaved thy face, and lopped a true friend from my loving soul? Prince, th thy sweet bemoaning speech to me is as a mournful knell to one dead sick. Dear Audley, if my tongue ring out thy end, my arms shall be thy grave. What may I do to win thy life, or to revenge thy death? If thou wilt drink the blood of captive kings, or that it were restorative, command a health of king's blood, and I'll drink to thee. If honor may dispense for thee with death, the never-dying honor of this day share wholly, oddly, to thyself and live. Victorious prince, <laughs> that thou art so, behold, a Caesar's fame in king's captivity. If I could hold him death but at a bay, till I did see thy liege, thy royal father, my soul should yield this castle of my flesh, this mangled tribute, with all willingness to darkness, consummation, dust, and worms. Cheerily, old man, thy soul is all too proud to yield her city for one little breach. Should be divorced from her earthly spouse by the soft temper of a French man's sword? Lo! To all thy life I give to thee three thousand marks a year in English land. I take thy gift to pay the debts I owe. These two poor squires redeemed me from the French with lusty and dear hazard of their lives. What thou hast given me, I give to them. <laughs> and as thou lovest me, prince, lay thy consent to this bequeath in my less testament. Renowned oddly, live, and have from me this gift twice double to these esquires and thee. But live or die, what thou hast given away to these and there shall lasting freedom stay. Come, gentlemen, I will see my friend bestowed within an easy litter, then will march proudly toward Calais with triumphant pace unto my royal father, and there bring the tribute of my wars, fair France his king.
Act 5, Scene 1, Picardy, the English camp before Calais. Enter King Edward, Queen Philippa, Darby, and soldiers. No more, Queen Philippa, pacify yourself. Copeland, except he can excuse his fault, shall find displeasure written in our looks. And now unto this proud resisting town. Soldiers, assault! I will no longer stay to be deluded by the false delays. Put all to sword and make the spoil your own. Mercy, King Edward! Mercy, gracious lord! <laughs> Contemptuous villains! Call ye now for truce! Mine ears are stopped against your bootless cries. Sound drums, alarum! Draw threatening swords! Ah, noble prince, take pity on this town. Hear us, mighty king, we claim the promise that your highness made. The two days' respite is not yet expired, and we are come with willingness to bear what torturing death or punishment you please, so that the trembling multitude be saved. My promise? Well, I do confess as much. But I do require the chiefest citizens and men of most account that should submit. You, peradventure, are but servile grooms or some felonious robbers on the sea, whom apprehended law would execute. Albeit severity lay dead in us. No, no, ye cannot overreach us thus. The sun, dread lord, that in the western fold beholds us now low brought through misery. Did in the orient purple of the moon salute our coming forth when we were known? Or may our portion be with damned fiends. If it be so, then let our covenant stand. We take possession of the town in peace, but for yourselves look you for no remorse. But as imperial justice hath decreed, your bodies shall be dragged about these walls and after feel the stroke of quartering steel. This is your doom. Go, soldiers, see it done. Ah, be more mild, and to these yielding men. It is a glorious thing to establish peace. And kings approach the nearest unto God by giving life and safety unto men. As thou intendest to be king of France, so let her people live to call thee king. For what the sword cuts down or fire hath spoiled is held in reputation none of ours. Although experience teach us this is true, that peaceful quietness brings most delight, when most of all abuses are controlled. Yet insomuch it shall be known that we as well can master our affections as conquer other by the dint of the sword. Philippa prevail. We yield to thy request. These men shall live to boast of clemency. And tyranny, strike terror to thyself. Long live your highness, happy be your reign. Go, get you hence, return unto the town. And if this kindness hath deserved your love, learn then to reverence Edward as your king. Now might we hear of our affairs abroad. We would, till gloomy winter were or spent, dispose our men in garrison a while. But who comes here? Oakland, my lord, and David, king of Scots. Is this the proud, presumptuous Esquire of the North that would not yield his prisoner to my queen? I am, my liege and northern squire, indeed, but neither proud nor insolent, I trust. What moved thee, then, to be so obstinate to contradict our royal queen's desire? No will for disobedience, mighty lord, but my desert and public law at arms. I took the king myself in single fight, and like a soldier would be loath to lose the least preeminence that I had won. And Copland straight away, your highness charge, is come too fast, and with a lowly mind doth veil the bonnet of his victory, receive, dread lord, the cost of my fraught, the wealthy tribute of my labouring hands, which should long since have been surrendered up, had but your gracious self been there in place. But Copland, you did scorn the king's command, neglecting our commission in his name. His name I reverence, but his person more. His name shall keep me in allegiance still, but to his person I will bend my knee. I pray thee, Philippa, let this pleasure pass. This man doth please me, and I like his words. For what is he that will attempt great deeds and lose the glory that ensues the same? 
All rivers have recourse unto the sea in Copeland's faith relation to his king, Neil, therefore down. Now rise, King Edward's knight, and to maintain thy state I freely give five hundred marks a year to thee and thine. Welcome, Lord Salisbury. What news from Bretain? Uh, this mighty king, the country we have won, and John de Montfort, regent of that place, presents your highness with this coronet, protesting true allegiance to your grace. We thank thee for thy service, valiant earl. Challenge our favor, for we owe it thee. But now, my lord, as this is joyful news, so must my voice be tragical again, and I must sing of doleful accidents. What? Have I meant the overthrow at Poitiers? Or is our son beset with too much odds? He was, my lord, and as my worthless self with forty other serviceable knights, under safe conduct of the Dauphin's seal, did travail that way, finding him distressed, a troop of lances met us on the way, surprised, and brought us prisoners to the king, who, proud of this and eager of revenge, commanded straight to cut off all our heads, and surely we had died, but that the duke, more full of honor than his angry sire, procured our quick deliverance from thence. But ere we went, salute your king, quoth he, bid him provide a funeral for his son. Today our sword shall cut his thread of life, and sooner than he thinks will be with him, to quittance those displeasures he hath done. This said, we passed, and not daring to reply, our hearts were dead, our looks diffused and wan. Wandering, at last we climbed unto a hill, from whence, although our grief were much before, Yet now to see the occasion with our eyes did thrice so much increase our heaviness. For there, my lord, oh, there we did descry down in a valley how both armies lay. The French had cast their trenches like a ring, and every barricado's open front was thick embossed with brazen ordnance. Here stood a battle of ten thousand horse, there twice as many pikes in quadrant wise, here crossbows and deadly wounding darts, and in the midst like to a slender point within the compass of the horizon, as twere a rising bubble in the sea, a, ha a hazel wand amidst a wood of pines, or as a bear fast chained into a stake, stood famous Edward, still expecting when those dogs of France would fasten on his flesh. Anon the death procuring now begins, off go the cannons, that with trembling noise did shake the very mountain where we stood, then sound the trumpets clangor in the air, the battles join, and when we could no more discern the difference twixt the friend and foe, so intricate that our confusion was, away we turned our watery eyes with sighs, as black as powder fuming into smoke, and thus I fear, unhappy have I told the most untimely tale of Edward's fall. Ah, oh, me! Is this my welcome unto France? Is this the comfort that I look to have when I should meet with my beloved son? Oh, sweet Ned, I would my mother in the sea that had prevented of this mortal grief. Content thee, Philippa. Tis not tears will serve to call him back if he be taken hence. Comfort thyself, as I do, gentle queen, with hope of sharp, unheard of, dire revenge. He bids me to provide his funeral, and so I will. But all the peers in France shall mourners be, and weep out bloody tears until their empty veins be dry and sear. The pillars of his hearse shall be his bones, the mould that covers him their city ashes, his knell, the groaning cries of dying men. And in the stead of tapers on his tomb, an hundred fifty towers shall burning blaze while we bewail our valiant son's decease. Rejoice, my lord, ascend the imperial throne. The mighty and redoubted Prince of Wales, great servitor to bloody Mars in arms, the Frenchman's terror and his country's fame, triumphant rideth like a Roman peer, and lowly at his stirrup comes afoot King John of France, together with his son in captive bonds, whose diadem he brings to crown thee with, and to proclaim thee king. Away with mourning, Philippa. Wipe thine eyes. Sound trumpets welcoming Plantagenet. 
As things long lost, when they are found again, so doth my son rejoice his father's heart, for whom even now my soul was much perplexed. It is a token to express my joy or inward passion without witnesses. My gracious father here receives the gift. This wreath of conquest and reward of war got with this mickle peril of our lives as e'er was thing of price before this day. Install your highness in your proper right, and herewithal I render to your hands these prisoners, chief occasion of our strife. <laughs> so, John of France, I see you keep your word. You promised to be sooner with ourselves than we did think for, and tis so indeed. But, had you done it first, as now you do, how many civil towns had stood untouched that now are turned to ragged heaps of stones? How many people's lives mightst thou have saved that are untimely sunk into their graves? Edward, recount not things irrevocable. Tell me what ransom thou requirest to have. <laughs> Thy ransom, John, hereafter shall be known. But first... To England thou must cross the seas, to see what entertainment it affords. However it falls, it cannot be so bad, as ours have been since we arrived in France. Accursed man! Of this I was foretold, but did misconster what the prophet told. Now, father, this petition Edward makes to thee, whose grace hath been his strongest shield, that, as thy pleasure chose me for the man to be the instrument to show thy power, so thou wilt grant that many princes more, bred and brought up within that little isle, may still be famous for like victories. And, for my part, the bloody scars I bear, and weary nights that I have watched in field, the dangerous conflicts I have often had, the fearful menaces proffered me, the heat and cold and what else might displease, I wish were now redoubled twentyfold, that hereafter ages, when they read the painful traffic of my tender youth, might thereby be inflamed with such resolve as not the territories of France alone, but likewise Spain, Turkey, and what countries else that justly would provoke fair England's ire might, at their presence, tremble and retire. Here, English lords, we do proclaim a rest, an intercession of our painful arms. Sheath up your swords. Refresh your weary limbs, peruse your spoils, and after we have breathed a day or two within this haven town, God willing, then for England we'll be shipped, where, in a happy hour, I trust we shall arrive, three kings, two princes, and a queen. Thank you for watching, and we hope that you enjoyed Edward III. Let's bring back our players and our director, Jason Rennie, Christopher Carbo, Taylor Marr, Sasha Venn, Megan Wells, Chris Klein, Caitlin McCormick, Ben Birmingham, Elizabeth Juvena, Elise Ashton, Julie Measley Grossman, and I'm Mary Kerrig. Join us next time for Time in of Athens. Thank you.